Hi, Dr. Carol. Hi, Davis and Farnaz. Hi, Bokum and George and Greg and Carrie. Hi, Keisha. Hi, Kimberly, Kirsty. Hi, Lawrence. Hi, Nahal, Rakasha. Hi, Shanda. Hi, Tim and Vicki. If you are new, welcome to the OUM community. I'm Associate Professor Nicolette McGuire. I'm OUM's Associate Dean for Student Engagement, and you will also see me in the preclinical years teaching in endocrine and reproduction. If you are joining us again, welcome back. It's great to see you. Today, we're so pleased to welcome Dr. Carol Jesse. Hi, Dr. Carol. Hi, how is everybody? I'm great. And uh, if you'd like to respond to Dr. Jesse or to answer her or ask her a question <laughs> the webinar, um, you can please use our Q&A box and we'll select some of those questions throughout the webinar. I'm also going to be ask asking Dr. Carol a series of questions so that we can get to know her uh, better. So I hope you'll all settle in and join us for a wonderful conversation. So I'm so pleased to have you, Dr. Carol. You're an OUM 2023 graduate, and now you're a family medicine resident at the University of Alabama, which congratulations on that. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about where you're from, why you want to Doctor. <laughs> certainly, certainly. So my name is Carol Jesse, and um, I am a pretty simple, down to earth, very practical person. And uh, some of my background is I was a military child, one, the second of four, and uh, had a lot of responsibility early, early in life. We were a pretty poor family, and we moved around a lot. No one in my family ever went to college before, so to be here in this meeting is really quite a miracle for myself and my family. Um, so I moved all around growing up and spent a lot of years my in Alaska, and that's where all my siblings live. And so I ended up leaving Alaska and going to Oklahoma for my first undergraduate degree and met my husband in Oklahoma. And there's a little phrase out there that says, I wasn't born in the South, but I got here as quick as I could. And that's me. Um, so I just, I just love the South and I love how warm the people are and the temperatures. Um, and I, if I never saw ice and snow again and fell on the ice ever again, I would be okay with that. So, um, uh, so went to college, met my husband, we got married and he was in the military. He was in the National Guard. He's from a military family. I joined the military and we ended up, I ended up completing a second undergraduate degree. My first was in English education. My second was in nursing because all of my roommates were nurses and they had much cooler books than mine. <laughs> and so I found myself, I was supposed to read Shakespeare, but I was looking through all their books and looking at lymphedema and gangrene and awesome stuff like that. So <laughs> So I had some GI Bill money left. And so I decided mm, I'm going to use, I'm going to go to nursing school. So I used that money and went to nursing school. And I had a, a kind of a moment where I had to like either, I got a job offer in my first semester of doing prereqs. So I had to either go with education or go with nursing. So I stuck with nursing and I'm ever so glad. So I, um, my husband and I both being military, we ended up, uh, he came on active duty and we ended up moving around a lot and being a nurse was a beautiful profession for being, you know, moving that license all over the United States. We lived overseas in Korea for several years. Um, and then we had some children and I didn't, there was also a time in my life where I was doing nursing and I absolutely loved it. And there's a, there's a great space for education in nursing as well and in medicine. So that education degree really did come in handy. Um, so I just felt like, oh, I want to learn more. I want to do more. I love doing this nursing thing, but 
I just felt like I wasn't done. And so I had, I came to a place where I started looking at medical schools because I think I, I might could do that, but I don't know. There were no doctors in my family. I really wasn't sure if, you know, I was smart enough. So I started looking at, in Oklahoma at a DO program there. And shortly after that, I found out I was pregnant with our second child and then 9-11 happened. And then we came on active duty, started moving all around. So after a couple of years, I, I never lost that kind of hunger for medicine. And I decided, you know, I'm a, I'm a real, I'm a real spiritual, prayerful person. So I bathed that in a lot of prayer and really decided, you know, if I go to nurse practitioner school, it's, it's a shorter commitment and it gets me about 80% of where I want to be. And I did that. I went to nurse practitioner school and I was a nurse practitioner for 10 years and still never lost that hunger to go to medical school. And honestly, by then, and, and honestly, as a nurse practitioner, I had a lot of moments where I was like, why, why is that? Why does that happen? Here's the medicine, here's the disease, here's the medicine for it. But why is this happening? What does that mean? And I could never really understand a lot of the really complicated you know, electrolyte imbalances and thyroid, parathyroid, calcium, all that really complicated stuff. And so I just walked around with a lot of question marks over my head. And um, I decided one day, you know, and and I, I will put this out there. If I say anything that's useful to you, I hope you just take it because these are little tidbits of my life that I've lived over all these years. But I, I take time to think, to stop everything, turn everything off, just sit and think. And during some of those thinking moments, I heard this little voice inside me that said, I don't want to be 80 years old, sitting in a rocking chair, looking back at my life saying, I, oh, I could have been a doctor. Oh, I could have. And then I have this little baseball or little, you know, softball coach in my head that says the pushback, the challenge is like, oh, you say you could have, but really, could you have, what did you do about it? So that's kind of when I, I kind of walk myself through this place of like, I am not going to live with regret. I am not going to die with regret in my heart. So I will, I will step up to the plate and I will apply and I probably won't get in but I'm going to at least apply. And that's where the thing went. So I applied and I actually worked through, jumped through the hoops and got accepted. And then I said to myself, oh my God, I got accepted. Can I, am I even smart <laughs> enough? And that's when I was like, you know what, let's, and there's a little video of me a couple of years ago talking about this. I just envisioned myself like, we're not gonna, you know, go halfway. This is where I'm at the poker table. All my chips are going in. I'm going all in on this thing. It's all or nothing. And that's when um, I got accepted. I started doing the school, the, the matriculation, the schoolwork. I was getting really good grades. I, and we, we had some really challenging teachers during this time. Um, and I just kept going and passing and going and passing. And then the whole financial thing was a big, like, how, how is that going to happen in my, you know, and that's another thing I bathed in prayer. And it just, I just had a lot of opportunities as a nurse practitioner that I would not, I would have never saw coming that really helped finance uh, my way through school. So here I am, graduated, having no family history, no support as far as my organic family. I have, you know, my husband, my children are my support, but there's not anybody who's been able to just like sit me down and say, here's what you need to do. Do it like this. This is how I did it. You know, there's been none of that along the way. And coming from very meager roots it's it's really like how I just look back like how did this happen but a, it was just a lot of commitment and just a daily grind waking up every day and just doing it so that 
What else do you want to know about me there, Dr. McGuire? I want to ask you about that, like, niggling feeling that you had about more. Mm -hmm. I've, I've already gone so far in my career. I've done things that people in my family have not done that I didn't know that I could do um, because that wasn't, you know, what I thought was in my history, but I still wanted more. I went to nursing school. I went and did my um, NP, but I still wanted more. So what I want to ask you is now that you're at the end of that, do you feel that you have more? Has that been like answered for you now? Julie, you know, my husband asked me a few months ago, like, honey, was it worth it all? Is it everything you thought it would be? And I took a few seconds and I was like, actually it is. I mean, this intern thing is hard, but it actually is. And I, I think I'm just really on the early cusp of that, understanding the full width of this accomplishment, because I... You know, heretofore, it's been licensing restrictions, and you can't do this because of this, that, and the other, and it's different in each state, but here I am as an as a physician, as an MD, and I can, I mean, I can do whatever I want, whatever, whatever I wish to pursue, there's really no, other than, you know, what's good sound clinical practice, there's nothing holding me back but myself. And that's what I've learned along the way is I've held myself back. And, and there was a time too, when I was going through all this process, I was waiting for somebody to give me permission to do this, you know, like waiting for my right. husband to say, go get it, hon. And it really, it was me standing in my own way. So once I just realized, hmm, this is something I can do and I'm going to do it until it comes to its own its own stop, you know? Um, and, but yeah, it is, it really is worth every moment that I've spent doing it. And, and again, I, like right now we're, we're talking about opening a private practice. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't really in, know that I could, that could be for me, you know? I love that you just gave yourself permission. You gave yourself permission to go for it. You're like, I'm a full grown woman. I'm capable. Yeah. I'm smart. I'm giving myself permission to do it because I can't say no to myself. I don't want to be, I think you said you're 80 years old and a rocker. <laughs> I don't want to be 80 years old and a rocker. I'm going to listen to myself. Now I'm going to give myself permission now. Um, okay. So you gave yourself permission to like get started in medical school and you're at the point now where you like have that more, that difference between what you were craving um, as a nurse and what you now have in terms of like the professional scope of practice, the ability to have your own private practice and so on and so forth. But what does it kind of take to actually get to that more? You, you said a little bit how, you know, you have to like buckle down and work hard and study, but what does it like actually take to be in medical school? Like what should, what does someone like need to actually get through and go to medical school? Well, I am a, I told you, I have a lot of responsibility as a child. Um, and as the, as a mom, I'm a natural leader in these military units. There's, and it's me serving other people constantly taking care of kids, taking care of elderly parents, taking care of people in my unit, in this family members in the unit, like it's doing, doing, doing for other people. So when I realized, okay, if this is my calling and if I want to be successful, I'm not, I'm not telling them no, but I'm just directing that energy in a different place so that I can say yes to what my responsibilities are now that I'm making this commitment. And then once I get on the other side of this kind of forest, then it opens my opportunities up to say yes to even more people in, in more roles and more opportunities. And that's kind of what I'm seeing right now um, as thinking about opening a practice and, and serving many, many more people supervising nurse practitioners, being an employer 
and having a, a safe, peaceful, comfortable place where people can work, you know, and that's, that's, that's huge. Um, but what I've had to do over the time is pre warn everybody when I was doing, uh, med school studies, cause I was very outgoing and go to social functions and host things and, you know, all that stuff. So I had to pre warn everybody. You won't see me on Facebook. I, I, I'm not going to be able to come to your parties, not because I don't want to, but because I'm doing this. Hello, family and children. You are able-bodied. Nobody here's in a wheelchair. You can make your own meals. You can do your own laundry. You can pack your own bags for trips that we go on. You know, I had to really enable everybody to be less and less dependent on me, which really was some of the best parenting I ever did, you know, um, yeah. and nobody, guess what? Nobody died along the way. No, the house never burned down. It like, got great skills. Everybody was <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I had to pre-warn everybody, then execute and do it. And rarely I did on occasion get to a, you know, a, a little event or a neighborhood thing, um, but it was few and far between. And then I had to really dial back on spending. Um, and I, I had to say to myself, okay, girl, if you're going all in, then let's put your money where your mouth is. Right. So these, you know, you know, shoe shopping and new pillows and stuff like this, I found to be really unessential to this mission that I'm doing. And then thinking about not just what I'm doing right now today, um, but what's going to happen in the next six months and then start longer range planning, like getting to that clerkship time period and planning for that. What did that look like and how are we going to make it happen? Don't tell me how it's going to fail. Let's see how we can make this. Let's get to the yes of how we can make this happen. So. And they just have to get on board. They do. And they, <laughs> and they did. And it was, it was bumpy for everyone, but you know, we all survived. We all made it through. And I mean, and fortunately my family is intact. Not everybody comes out with, you know, with their marriage intact and all that. Um, but it took, it took a lot of effort to really feed, fertilize all those things that I wanted to stay, to remain. And a lot of those friendships that were, you know, the neighborhood, they weren't real solid friendships and all it did would, would have stolen my time and it would have had zero yield in the long run. So I ended up turning those off. Um, and I was happy for it. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that we always talk about for success for medical students is having a strong support system, mm -hmm. you know, and part of that is not just having like a large number of people, but getting to know the people that are actually supportive <laughs> in your friend group and letting go of those relationships that maybe are not as strong and are not um, going, going to serve you in that way. I want to go to our Q&A box because we've got a lot of folks are interested in asking you some questions. Um, Nahal asks, what age did you start medical school? And you don't have to give a number, but maybe you want to talk about um, what it was like being what we'd say a mature medical student, someone who doesn't go, you know, graduate high school, immediately go to undergraduate, immediately go to medical school. What's it like being someone who's a more mature medical student? someone who's worked in the healthcare field before going to medical school? Well, I, I actually took a little bit of comfort in that when I went to my orientation in um, Houston, there was several of us that were nurse practitioners, pharmacists. Um, one was a pharmacy drug rep. Most all of us were over well into our 40s. Um, and don't, it's, it's rude to ask a lady her age, don't you know? That's why I'm saying don't, so you don't have to say your number, but it's funny because I, when you mentioned those um, uh, students, I know each of the ones that you're talking about, I'm like, oh yeah. Yes. Um, and, and honestly, we compared each other, we compared ages with each other. So I was not the oldest. Um, and, but I will say I did get braces right before I went, you know, cause that was another one of those things. Like I always wanted to get braces. So I just made that happen. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
And it, I felt like a young person because I had braces on. Um, and uh, what else? So it because I had colleagues my age at OUM, I didn't feel like it was unusual. Fast forward to right now, I'm in residency. And most people in my intern group, there's 12 interns, uh, like 30 might be the oldest, maybe very traditional, like high school, undergraduate, medical school, now residency, but they're exhausted. These people are exhausted. They got debt like crazy. They're struggling, like holding their, their marriages. To, some just got married in the last one to two years or six months. One just had their first baby. Like it is, it's a struggle any way you slice it. It's a struggle. I'm going to say I feel very, very fortunate that right now I just have to focus on my intern year. Yeah, I'm, my bones are a little older, but hey, I got it in me. These guys are struggling with all, you know, trying to keep their cars running, moving apartments, you know, will we ever have a baby, you know, struggling in new marriages. And I'm here I am. I've got several degrees. I've got experience. I have no college debt, none. Mm -hmm. Uh, my, I don't have to worry about my children because they're, they're independent. So to, to think about a toddler at home doing what I'm doing, I find, I, I probably would have had a breakdown by now if I was, if I was doing the, this in my youth versus at this point. And I will say too, when, even when I look at the other female physicians and attendings that we work with to be a working female physician with children and a family and a full-time job is rare. And I, it's like a diamond. That is a gem to be able to say you have that. One of my mentors in uh, she was my physician mentor in uh, med school. Um, she's probably 42, has always wanted children, never found the right guy along the way. Now she's married for one or two years now. And like that, that baby boat has kind of sailed for her. And she knows that. And she's choosing to like do, uh, not really foster, but like stuff with her church where she's taking on young people and doing some mothering for young people. Um, but, but it is, it's a, it's a lot of timing. And even though I came at it from the back end, this was great timing for me. Mm -hmm. I'm real happy with it. And uh, at OUM, we'll have, we have the whole spectrum, right? We'll have students who are the traditional path that are um, I mean, I don't even want to call it the traditional path, just the like established path, which is like high school, undergraduate and right into medical school. And we have a lot of students who are um, coming in after second, sometimes even third career. Mm -hmm. And there's it's not easy anyway, you slice it like there's going to be struggle um, getting through medical school and starting in at residency. But I'm just so happy to hear that, like you've been able to find a place and a space that works well with how you work internally and externally. Um, and maybe that's the magic of like finding the residency in the area that, that works for you as well. We'll talk about that um, in a bit, but I wanna get back to our, um, our question box, making sure that we are being responsive to those uh, who have some questions. Um, and Mesh just had a comment. I really love your storyline. I'm fully motivated and you put fire in my bones to get the MD under my belt. Thanks um, so much. So I'm uh, glad to hear that Mesh. I'm glad you joined us today. Um, and Cindy is asking about, um, she wanted to ask a US student if there are specific financial institutions that can help provide student loans to pay for medical school. And, you know, you're not a financial advisor, so I don't wanna ask you that exact question, but you had mentioned that you've gone fully through without student loans. So maybe you wanna give, um, you know, a little bit of your story about how you've managed to get through several degrees and not have student loans. Like, what did that take for you? Well, um, so in my, so first off, the thing that I have found to be 
the most helpful in my life is to just work, 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 grind every penny, every dime, every dollar counts. And this may be an old way of thinking about money, but, and you know, uh, just depends on, I think money is very cultural and we didn't have much growing up. And so everything we had, we, we really looked at it like, do, am I going to hold on to this? Or is that thing I'm going to give this dollar for worth what I'm giving it for? So I, I see money is very precious and, and, you know, ever like for me and our family going out and spending money, drinking or sp eating out a lot. It's for us, it's not worth that going on shopping sprees. Nobody is giving me money. All the money I have, I've earned. And so I'm trading my time for that. Um, what the thing that I, that I found to be successful in medical school was I knew I was applying. If I got in, I kind of knew when I was going to be starting. I knew how much those semesters were going to be. And I was able to work that first two years. So I would get bonuses at my work based on RVUs and production and all that. That entire bonus was put into an account for tuition. I also had a opportunity to be a speaker for a company. Each one of those paychecks was put into the account for tuition. When I started my first semester, I, I had already amassed, I mean, I was seeing like, how high can I get this account to build up, right? Yeah. And I already had my first semester paid for the day I started. By the time I finished that, that first semester, the second semester was paid for because I was pre-depositing all of it in there. And then I went through my first two years like ahead of the game. I knew how much it was going to cost. And then I already had, I could just write the check or, you know, send it because it was already done. Um, I didn't, I was, I didn't have to take out loans. I know some people have taken out like loans against, you know, second mortgages or things like that. I didn't also want to be on the hook for things I couldn't pay for if I didn't pass. So I would rather just pay, pay it forward and have that money committed than to have to owe something. Um, and, and I've seen people, you know, graduate with a degree and not get a job and then they couldn't pay off their, their, you know, money that they were indebted to for their like social work degree or some degree that did not have a lucrative paycheck. So I did not want to do that. Um, but that was, I just had some opportunities like that. And then I really watched everything I spent. So I, I cut off all that unnecessary stuff. And really it was, it was an all in thing. Like I said, like, really, do you need that? Let's put that $5, $10 towards the tuition. And that really motivated me to study hard. Like it wasn't a passive thing. It was like, I'm financially invested. I'm time committed, invested. You know, I bought a computer that was going to carry me through and that, you know, I, I put my money where my mouth was on that. So that's that's how that worked out for me. I don't have any magic answers for, um, uh, you know, financing for people. I also had some GI, some veterans money available. Unfortunately, the school wasn't hooked up to where I could have even used that. And that was a little bit of like a sore spot for me. But um, it's it is it turns out I didn't need it anyway. You know, it would have it would have been lovely but it just didn't work out like that but but if the school I remember was, trying to make that happen mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if, I mean if that's something that that the school can work on that'd be great but it's there's a lot of hoops to cross over yes it's interesting that you say that it's like kind of cultural because like I, I I'm located in Canada and we're very like anti-debt, like do not take on debt, you know, take on debt. Mm -hmm. um, and those of you who might be joining us from uh, Australia or Samoa or New Zealand may feel the same way as well. Um, but I think it's also really personal. Um, the one thing that we would recommend is to not start medical school in a state of financial stress. Mm -hmm. You don't want to start day one being stressed about your finances because you really need to reduce all unnecessary stressors outside the stress of learning the material and preparing for class. 
Um, so a lot of our students, like really um, prospective students, do spend a lot of time in the preparation stages of getting to medical school, thinking through their budgeting, um, and only starting when they feel like they're in the right financial state and they've got their budget worked out to do so. Um, with our new curriculum as well, we also recommend that students are preparing their budget where when they start medical school, they are not working. And then as they continue on through the course, um, if they're, they have time allowing with the additional study that's required that you add work back on after you've started. So it's really intensive program to get started. You don't wanna be having to work full time and getting so buried under the stress of all the material that you have to cover. So we recommend for most students that they try to for the first part um, to, to budget not working and then adding the work back in. But as you said, you know, you did um, you did it where um, you were working for the first couple of years and that worked for you. So um, we, it's a really individual decision amongst students and we really um, recommend that people um, work with their families and um, their personal financial advisors to figure that out because we don't want you entering school stressed <laughs> that we want your biggest stressor to be studying for your tests um okay anonymous wants to know how did you balance study with family commitments there's so much material um that you have to learn and you don't it's not in medical school and you'll you can reflect on this too but the learning in medical school is very different than the learning for other degrees. You're not just learning information and memorizing things. You have to learn it in a way that integrates everything that's already there and is already at a state of readiness to be applied. So it's not just that you need to store everything in your memory. You have to put it in a place where you can access it right away and integrate it with everything else. So can you answer <laughs> with that in mind? Sure. Can you answer anonymous attendee? They want to know how did you balance all the time that's required with study with family other commitments? So I had to do this very, very actively. So one thing that I did do, I really, I'm really glad I did was I I got an mm -hmm. app. I can't remember. It's like um it it would take a PDF. And I could load it on my phone. It was, it's a text to read or text to talk. And it would read the PDF and I cut off all music except for just maybe 30 minutes once a week or something. Because anytime that your mind is just, you're being a boggle brain, you're not focused on your content. So I would drive 40 minutes one way to go to work. That entire time I'm reading PDFs from the, the assigned reading on the way home, I'm reading that. At lunchtime, I'm looking over slides or looking over, you know, I'm getting my charting done and then getting into content for tonight's lecture or what we did last night. Because I am, I absolutely do not have a photographic memory. I have very brilliant people in my family who have photographic memories though their work effort is eh, eh, eh. they they're little you know they're procrastinators and they're distracted but i'm not as brilliant as they are but my work is so focused that it makes up for that so i put in extra time i have to have re repetition in order to learn a thing i don't get it in the first time it may be fourth time by the time i get it so that means Every, every lecture we do at nighttime, I'm re-listening to that on the weekends. I'm, I'm double, tripling lectures. I'm going over things two, three times. So it, I had to make that time happen. If I'm in the bathtub, I'm reading content. I'm all of this like, and I will say reels on Facebook are new since I was in medical school, but there's a whole lot of of time suck that can happen on the computer and there was no tv shows i didn't get into any binge watching any episodes of whatever whatever that was like shut off and that is where if you're really committed to this you really can't justify using time so accountability for time and money and then being efficient in the things that i did need to do like getting groceries making a meal for my family, I would make oodles of it and then we would eat leftovers. So there's one time cooking and then everybody can reheat, you know? Um, 
so just being very efficient in those other tasks. Um, I would give my family and, and it was really just myself and my children. I didn't have a lot of extended family nearby that I needed to spend time with, but I did have, you know, phone calls and things like this made them happen, but didn't like go prolonged in the conversation, kept some finite time periods because you can't get that time back, you know? And, and so that's, I had to very budget that. It's your greatest resource, right? It's time. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, we have a question about clinical rotations and I, I'd love to hear about that from you too. Um, they wanted to know, how did you plan around doing your clinical rotations, selecting locations and what is it like? So tell us a little bit about your experience in clinical rotations. And maybe I'll just, before you answer that, just so everybody's on the same page, um, you probably know, maybe if you've talked with your admissions counselor, you know that the first couple of years of the program, we call it the preclinical years, and that's where you're doing your um, online and Zoom-based lectures in the preclinical systems. So you have general principles and a musculoskeletal system, endocrine system, so on and so forth. Then you do a clinical transition unit, and then you get into the everyone's favorite part of the program, which is the clinical rotations, where you're going out into pediatrics and community and family medicine, and so on and so forth. So tell us, Dr. Carroll, a little bit about your experience in clinical rotations. Um, so, I, so we had opportunities in Texas and Chicago and Samoa and, and a lot of things changed. This was right around when COVID was starting. Um, I had lived in Texas at Fort Hood when we were uh, active duty. Um, so I was in, we lived in Oklahoma many years, Oklahoma, Texas are like cousins. And, and so I was pretty familiar with Texas, familiar with the culture um, and so I was like, I'm just going to Texas. So I, what I ended up doing because I did not care to, and keep in mind, we're military. We move a lot. I know what that moving is like. I've done it a lot. So I didn't really care to be walking a couch and a mattress upstairs and getting pet, you know, an apartment, all this stuff. So Remember, I told you I'm from Alaska, so we do a lot of outdoorsy stuff out there, right? So I said, hmm, why don't I just buy a camper? So I bought an RV. We towed it down there, put it in a, a well, I wasn't really old enough to be in the senior, like, mobile home, but they let yeah. me in because I was a medical person. So fun. it was great. The tell you must have had <laughs> It was the best, the best. So I had my own little, I was like a snail. I had my own little house on wheels. <laughs> we rolled it up in there. Everything was in place. Uh, it was much less expensive than an apartment. I didn't have to move anything upstairs. We actually had a, a little um, like tour of homes because there was another one in the in the trailer park and another girl from another school rented one so we had a little tour of homes one night in the trailer park and you know we had cocktails and talked you know just medical student shop and attendings and stuff but I was able to sell that trailer for more than I bought it for and re recoup all that money that I would have otherwise put into rent and it it helped me also to to be conservative with funds and you now I have money to pay for you know more tuition and things like this so so that worked out beautifully my clerkships in Texas were wonderful um we had excellent attendings down there there was a a great variety of settings to practice in um several of those attendings wrote me letters for uh for match for the ERAS. They must have done a good job because I matched, right? Um, and uh, the Spanish that we learned in, in McAllen out of necessity has come in handy. Like every day I go to work, there's usually somebody there that I have to communicate some way or fashion in Spanish with. Um, and it's, it's been a, a, unexpected learning that was 
just really essential to where, where I'm going and what's happening. So, um, I, I loved my time in Texas and, and I really went there for the culture. I wasn't, I told you already, I didn't like the cold. I didn't like the snow and I'm not sure I'm fond of the culture in Chicago. So I, I went to the South. I didn't know that about the RV. What a good idea. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you guys have a lot of them in Canada? Um, yes. I mean, people do a lot of camping and traveling here. Mm -hmm. it's, you wouldn't like it, though, because of the ice and snow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Mesh wants to know about the USMLE steps. So that's the United States Medical Licensure Exam. So um, if anyone's joining us from um, outside the United States, so th those are the exams that um, are taken by medical students between their preclinical and clinical years, and then another is taken um, after the end of the core rotations. Um, and those are the exams, and there's a third after that, <laughs> that are mm -hmm. required for licensure in the United States. So it's not too dissimilar to the um, AMC or the NZREX or the MCCQE, for example. So Carol, tell us a little bit about your um, experience with the USMLE steps and about um, supports. Okay, uh, so this was the the daunting task of all. Um, we were, our class was in this strange place where a lot of things were changing as far as requirements for graduation, in-house exam, not in-house, you know, all this was changing and in flux. Um, and the thing that kind of my takeaways for this was, this is, this is the culminating event of what we're doing here. Um, this is the hoop you must jump through in America to get to where you need to be for match. And if you're not willing to do that, then you have to question what are we even doing here besides just getting a degree. We are getting an MD degree. Let's not uh, minimize that at all. So mm -hmm. in the US, you have to pass these step one, two, and three. Um, when I started, they it was very well known that your curriculum only is going to get you about 30% of the content on those exams. And I don't know if we if that's the case still, but that means we have to do a lot of self-study. And I found that's one of the differences in nursing and medicine is nobody is spoon feeding you. You have to go out and basically teach yourself. You need to you need to self-assess. What are my weaknesses? What do I not know? What am I uncomfortable with? And seek out that knowledge and teach, find avenues that will teach in the style that you learn from. One of my favorites was Boards and Beyond. I love, love the guy who teaches that. I love his voice. Sketchy was excellent as well. There's a lot out there. And, and I would go through them two and three times in order to get the content and feel like I owned it. Um, the other thing I did, and so this is after I've finished all the curriculum, all the clerkships, I'm here at my house studying 12, 14 hours a day, making, I'm a tactile, I'm a, I'm a well-rounded, I'm an audio, I'm a visual, I'm a tactile. And so I had to make things that I could, you know, like move a puzzle piece to get the right answer on a, you know, card stock kind of a thing, or you know, draw the picture. And these are the neurosynapses that, that help us retain the information. Reading did not do it. Mm -hmm. Listening by itself did not do it. So I had to be an active, I had to do the active parts of it. Um, I also, and, and not everybody would say this was smart to do or good to do, but I actually got on, there's a step, USMLE step one thread on Reddit. And this is all the American students comparing their, this is what I used to learn. This is the, I love this. This didn't work out for me. Oh, woe is me. My score is this. It's, it's a big wine session. So take what you need out of that. But I was able to find some resources in there that I did not know about that could help me get even a few more inches deeper into the the knowledge of things. So now we take the uh um what is our what oh it just escaped me the, the NBME. 
NBME, yes. Okay, so that is the gateway for the school to allow you to test for step one and step two, actually. Um, I personally found that the NBME is harder than step one. And let me, I don't want to say step one's not hard. It is completely, terribly hard. But but I found that when I did my practice NBMEs and I was getting my scores were getting up in there, getting closer, getting closer, then I felt with confidence I can take the NBME in, in my home setting or I didn't take them in Prometric, but I could take those and and then get a pass to get the token to test. I will also say there's a thing called free 120 where you take, um, after you get your token for USMLE, you register for free 120. It's not really free. You have to pay the testing thing, but it's a dress rehearsal for taking step one. You go to the center with your pass. They check you in your locker. They check you into the building. They sit you at the computer. So all of that would have otherwise been very nerve wracking for me on the day of the test but I got to work through that process. And that was one of the things I found on the Reddit thread was the free 120. You go there and you take 120 questions and it's dress rehearsal for the real day. And it really lowered my anxiety level. So I could focus, read the questions. I actually didn't know about free 120. And uh, um, I mean, you may, you may not know this, Carol, and, and uh, some of those some of you who've come to our webinars before may know that we have a, an accommodation equity and inclusion um, planning process uh, that I run. And that would actually be really helpful for some of our students who are on accommodation plans who do have testing type anxiety. So I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've always, I always learned something. Yeah, the testing centers have accommodations that they can provide as well. You know, like, yes, okay. Got that. Yeah. I was yeah. sick. Somebody gave me COVID two a week before I went and tested. So I had to have a, a breathe right strip on, on my nose so I could breathe. And I had like a, a, like a waist belt on for my back. And, you know, I had orthopedic shoes on, like yeah. all these things that I needed for myself to test well, you know. We actually um, base our AEI planning on the AEI planning that is allowed in the board exams because we want to make sure that our students have access to the same types of accommodations that they would have so that they are every test they're taking, they're taking them as if they were taking their board exams. Um, I wanted to just add to a little bit um, of what we were telling Mesh and the rest of our um, attendees about um, this, the supports uh, from uh, OUM for passing the USMLE steps. And some of these are new, um, newer programs. And I, so we have a newer curriculum now, which we call our MedSci curriculum. And the way that that curriculum is designed is that we use the content guides for the USMLE steps. We use the content guide for the AMC, for the NZ RECs, the MCCQE, um, and the NAC, which are the two Canadian exams. And so our preclinical curriculum is based on the content guides for the board exams um, that you have to take. And so all of this, the styles of questions that you'll receive in the preclinical courses are the types of questions you'll receive on those exams. And then for students who are in the United States um, and Canada, or students who are in Australia, New Zealand, or Samoa who wish to pass licensure exams in the US, if they want to practice in the US in the future, um, do have access to our USMLE prep program. And as part of that program, they have access to some of the resources that you were discussing, but most students do go and get outside resources as well. And that's not just OUM, but really, I mean, probably on Reddit, so every medical student at every medical school is using outside resources. In addition, everybody's got like an arsenal <laughs> to get through it. Um, and then um, uh, just to give the acronym NBME for folks that are interested in, in looking this up and learning more after our conversation today, it's the National Board of Medical Examiners, and they have a series of practice tests. They have subject exams um, in each of the systems areas uh, for, that are tested on the USMLE Step 1, and they also have a self-assessment that it's the, the broader spectrum. Um, so you can go on their website and have a look at you know, the practice exams that are on there. Those are the, the hurdle exams that our students take in preparation for the USMLE. 
um, step one and step two. Rakasha has a good question that's transitional into the next part, because after we do our clinical rotations, take our licensure <laughs> exams, is residency. And Rakasha is asking specifically as someone from Alabama who's interested in possibly obtaining a residency at UAB, where you're a resident, um, or somewhere else in Alabama, could you speak to your experience during the match process? How receptive were interviewers about your attending a hybrid program such as OUM? And just for those of you who are outside the US, the match is the name of the program for matching into a first year um, program as a medical resident. So Dr. Carroll, could you provide us a little bit okay. of information about- All right. So. I was a family medicine nurse practitioner and I pretty much zoned in on that. Plus I'm very practical about what there's a lot of medicine is very connected and networked. And again, I have no doctors in my family and I don't have anybody rooting for me. So I was very realistic about let's just go with medicine. I wasn't needing to be a surgeon or urologist or anything like that. Could I do it? Yes. Do I want, you know, let's be practical. I just need to get matched. And I'm, I love that I matched family medicine because it is the broadest of all categories. So the process, um, uh, this is really, really important. And, uh, if anybody's looking for family medicine, I would strongly encourage you to do this be a uh, AAFP student member. They have a conference every year in Kansas City. AAFP is based out of Kansas City. They have a, a student conference where if you've ever gone to, to a conference before and they have an industry floor where there's all these vendors have their little booth and you walk past and get their pen and their candy and talk with them about their thing, that's what goes on at AAFP Kansas City in July. I think it's in August this year. Every single fan, I can't say every single, but a ton of family medicine programs are there in their little booth. They're arranged per state. You go to that conference, you learn some things, and then you go walk the floor and you visit all of these. These booths have the program directors. Who's making the final decision on whether you get in or not in those programs? The program director. So you're meeting them firsthand right there. If you have interest in a program that's near you, you better go to that booth and shake a hand and look somebody in the eye and tell them your little story and get to know some people. So I, when I was in McAllen, everything was shut down. AAFP had an online one of those in, I don't know, 2021 or something. And I attended also, I think it was, I think it was that they have a poster. You can submit a poster and once you, and then give a, a talk about it. Now you put that on your ERAS application as a poster presentation. So um, I would strongly encourage people to do that because that fills up that blank space in your ERAS application. So fast forward to the AAFP. We did it online. I met some people. So I was in Oklahoma when all this was going on. They did the breakout rooms, blah, blah, blah. And I met some people online that were with the program. I was in Texas when that happened. These people are in Alabama. I don't know anybody here, but I knew this was the program that I want. I had strong interest in coming to because it was in my local area. And I didn't want to move away from my family again for three years. So I got some, uh, did the, did the little breakout rooms, had a good time, got some names. They got my name the next year. Um, I'm not sure if it was, the, I think it was, I don't, I don't quote me on the times, but that name I got from the first year, I emailed that individual to say, Hey, I'm coming to AAFP this year. Are you all going to be there? Cause I'm going to come to your booth. And it was this guy named Chandler Stisher. And he was a resident at some point, um, super friendly, ex you know, just lovely individual. And um, he, he said, yeah. I, and he was married to somebody else in the program. I get to the AAFP booth in Kansas City in the year before I matched. 
And I don't know anybody in the whole place. I go out, you know, all these schools in Alabama. And then I see UAB Huntsville. And so I go up to the booth and I go, Chandler, Chandler Stisher, Dr. Stisher. He goes, Carol. And we give each other this big old hug and like we're best buddies or something. And we just had, and then he introduced me to Dr. Blevins, the program director, and she's got videos on the, on the website, like UAB family medicine, I'm the program director. And she's this beautiful, lovely country lady. And I just was like, oh, oh that's her. I was just like celebrity awestruck when I met her. I had no words at that moment because I needed, I just needed her to pick me out of a stack of 1200 applications. So we had a great visit, went and saw them the next day because it's a two day conference, saw them both days. Hey, hey, remember me? And they actually had a, a, they had some little trinkets on their table that they would give just anybody that they saw. But then they had some serious gifts at the back wall, which was a backpack with their name on it, UAB. And they handed me one of those backpacks, which I was like, whoa, that's a, that's like a first date kind of commitment right there. <laughs> right. So here I am walking around the whole thing with the UAB backpack on, and I'm feeling like this is, this is kind of, I, I realized what a big gesture that was because there were not many of those backpacks. So that kind of was a little bit of a return handshake, like they might be interested in me. So um, fast forward, go to church at like a few weeks later, and I'm standing there drinking some coffee. And I look over and I'm like, that, that guy looks like that guy Chandler Stisher I met. And he walks up, he goes, Carol. And it was him. We actually, we go to a really large church, but it was, we go to the same church. Oh, honey. I know. And so we just got to be friends and I got to know his wife. Well, like these are the connections that I never saw that connection coming in a million years. I could not have planned that. And th then, I mean, it just was such a beautiful moment at that time. And all I could do was just apply. So that's that program. I applied to several other programs, several here in Alabama, some in Tennessee. And I got a lot of that same, these programs are looking for people who can make a joke, talk, tell a story, let, you know, re listen. They want people who can listen to them and hear about their program. They want somebody who can demonstrate that they can work their fingers to the bone because the kind of hours that they ask you to do is not for the light, lightweights out there who just think they want to be a doctor. You know, if you can demonstrate, I'm, I can commit to you and I'm not. And so one of the black marks on a program is to lose a resident. So we have 12 spots. We better graduate 12 pro people. You don't want to get somebody who's going to have and, and these are some of the red flags that they try to kind of weed out is, is basically like, oh, this one's, you know, had a lot, too many jobs or didn't finish things or, you know, they want somebody who's got a lot of commitment. If you come in with some clinical experience or some life experience or have demonstrated like being in the military, that you can endure some adverse conditions and complete the task, that's the kind of person they're, these programs are looking for. You know, I, my dad's not a neurosurgeon. I, I can't bring them any notoriety. And actually one of the guys that's in our program, his dad is a multi, multi millionaire ophthalmologist. They didn't hire this guy because of that. They, and they hired him because he has some experience and that like that grit to him that gets him through tough things. He has a pretty interesting story. And they hired you. Like they, it was you and like your personality, not just your like accomplishments and grades and like all those things got you to the table, but you also had to bring yourself, right? Which is absolutely. And this program in particular loves people who are connected to this area. 
uh, there are many programs who are looking for that thing. Like if they, they're heavy in, you know, elderly care or diabetes care, find out what it is that they're kind of looking for and elevate that in your life so you can connect with them. I, uh, I, so some, some are very like urban. They want to reach that urban un, uh, treated community. And if you have a, a, you know, a desire to do that and go into, you know, be in some rough places or work without, you know, picture perfect equipment all the time, or, you know, help the elderly and poor communities. They love it. If that's what you want to do and you find a program that does that, then, then they love that stuff. But for certain, they really appreciate people who have clinical experience coming in. <clears throat> um, I am so enjoying talking to you, but we're running a little bit over time, unfortunately. Um, but I want to ask before we go, if you have any advice that you want to share to um, our prospective students that are on the call today who are thinking about applying to medical school, do you have any advice for them? Well, you've heard a lot of my little sayisms, like, you know, put your money where your mouth is, like step up to the plate, don't stand in your own way, go all in. I would also say it's, it's dawned on me through this whole process, know the rules, play the game, read the rule book, find out what it is that's required to finish this degree and get it done as quick as possible. Don't linger in that research project or doing what some of, you know, get, just check off that requirement list. It's the same way with the ERAS application. You need to know what it is by reading what nobody sits down and holds your hand and tell you what you got to do. You got to read through it and then check list it off. Know those rules, play the game, and you might be surprised where you get in the end run because people will either maybe be incomplete or they didn't know because somebody didn't tell them or, but, but knowing those rules is an investment in your own pathway so that you don't have some kind of oversight that would be an obstacle. So I wish everybody just tremendous best wishes and, and wisdom and excellent outcomes in your studies and clinicals. Thanks, Dr. Carol. We really appreciate um, that and, and for you taking the time. I just want to share from Keisha, who says, I'm from Alabama too. I hope I go to UAB as well. And really nice to see you, Keisha. And then Nahal just says, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and talking to us, Dr. Carol. So Certainly. that too from everyone. Thank you so much. Really appreciated this time to chat with you. And for those of you who joined us today, we're so glad that you, you were here. And we also appreciate you joining us. If you didn't have your question uh, answered live today, I'm going to be providing those to the admissions counselors. And we'll make sure that we get back to you with answers on all of those. And we hope to see you at our next live session next month. See you all then. Bye for now. Okay, feel free to Hi, email if I can answer any other questions. Okay, yeah, if you want to further talk to Dr. Carol, let your admissions counselor know and they'll get you in touch. Okay. Thanks, Bye -bye everybody. Now. Bye.